So thank you very much, uh, Stefan and Michel, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation to speak at this most auspicious meeting. Yes, my talk is entitled Environmental Chemicals, Thyroid Woman and Human Intelligence. And indeed, it is a disquieting fact when one looks at the massive accumulation of chemi man-made chemicals in our environment and to, to, to make the, 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 to see the number of chemicals that are being accumulated not only in the environment but also in, in humans. And of course, that includes the most vulnerable populations, pregnant women and children. Now, my, my talk is going to focus on thyroid hormone and the brain, but I don't need to tell you that the chemical burden that we are all carrying in us is not only affecting the nervous system, but it's affecting many physiological systems from the reproductive system, growth, control of growth, and even the immune system. My work has led me to found a company, Watchfrog, which does environmental screening, so I have to declare my conflict of interest, but I do underline that I get no financial compensation from this. So as many of you in the room will be aware, there is an unexplained increase in many forms of neurodevelopmental disease. And this is best characterized, at least it's best documented, for autism spectrum disorders. In the States, the best data we have, even though it was collected four years prior to 2014 and 16, is that now one in 68 children are affected by a disease on the autumn spectrum disorder. And this, of course, given the increased incidence in boys, means it's one in 42 boys. Obviously, changes in diagnosis, increased awareness have contributed to this increase. But many authors concur on the fact that 50% of this increase is due to unknown factors other than diagnosis and awareness. And of course, today we are looking much more at the problems that could be caused by environmental chemicals and how they could be uncovering genetic susceptibilities. I also want to underline that if you look at the American data closely, you'll see that according to the state, about 40% of the children, sometimes it's much higher, South, Southern Carolina, it's gonna be 70% of the children have IQs under 70. And if you start to include the, the children with the, the limit of learning uh, of intellectual deficiency, IQs of less than 85, it's even worse. Similar things are being seen for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where the latest Statistics from the Centers for Disease Control show that we're at 14% of boys showing this disorder. Now, it's a bit too simplistic, you're going to tell me, to show a series of curves increasing and say, well, it's obviously got something to do with this. I don't say it's obvious, but I do say it's highly probable. Chemical output, this is uh, data from the United Nations, and. Here we start in 1970, we don't go back to the 1940s and 50s when chemical output really started to increase. From the 1970s, we've gone to today a 250-fold increase and we're set to reach a 300-fold increase both in developed regions and in developing countries. It's not surprising that Linda Birnbaum, the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health in the States has said, Exposure to multiple chemicals inevitable. We live in a chemical soup. Now, my hypothesis that I'm, will be, I've been working on for a while and I will elaborate today is that many of these industrial chemicals are halogenated. And because they are halogenated, they have the capacity to interfere with thyroid hormone signaling. I don't need to tell this audience that thyroid hormone is the most complex halogenated molecule synthesized by vertebrates, and it's the only one to contain iodine. And you all know the importance of both iodine and hormone for brain development. This is the sort of slide that is not supposed to be read. It's just one part of a table taken from Housdell's paper in 2002 on environmental health, in, in environmental health perspectives showing the list of targets and the types of chemicals that can hit them, and the targets are implicated in thyroid hormone signaling. 
So the take-home message is quite simple. It is thought that thyroid hormone production and signaling is prone to disruption by more chemicals than any other endocrine system. And this is doubly unfortunate. Because we have known for a long while that without a minimum of thyroid hormone at the right time, a tadpole fails to become a frog, so we've got environmental consequences, but a human baby becomes a cretin. The average IQ of a cretin is about 35. Luckily, iodine was discovered in 1813, but again, I think it's important to recall that iodine deficiency is still a major cause of mental, preventable intellectual retardation. And 100 years later, thyroid hormone was isolated, and luckily again, cretinism has been virtually eradicated worldwide, and this is due to postnatal thyroxine therapy that began in the 1970s. But we've known about these problems now for literally hundreds of years. But in the last 20 years, we've witnessed a, a, a complete change in the manner in which we understand thyroid hormone signaling. We found out about cell-specific membrane transporters. MCT8 is expressed in neurons in humans. It's the only transporter expressed in humans. And its, abs its mutation will cause a, a major disease, Alan Hunt Dudley Hernan syndrome, which is characterized by severe mental retardation and also muscle disorders. We've learned about the fact that there are hidden, or well, let's say difficult to find, TR-alpha mutations, TR-beta mutations had been observed much, long, much earlier on. Another thing we've learned about is the need for tight control of maternal thyroid hormone levels in early pregnancy. Very important concept that just measuring T3 and T4 in the circulating well, in blood does not reflect what's going on in the brain. This may not impact on your clinical practices, but it certainly impacts on the way that we do our research and the way we understand um, how circulating levels might not be correlated with tissue levels. And I won't have the time to talk about this today, but we're also learning how thyroid hormone is a key player in determining lineage decisions in stem cell populations. I just want to highlight this idea of maternal levels of thyroid hormone in early pregnancy. As Jean-Claude emphasized, the fetal origin or the developmental origin of adult disease has become a mainstream idea. And Time magazine had a cover many years ago now stating how the first nine months of your life are going to shape the rest of your life. I would say, if we're talking about brain development and thyroid hormone, I would say three. And there's a lot of data been coming out on this in the last 15 years in particular, but I think one of the most striking set of results was that from Tim Corrivar, working in Robin Peters' lab, who showed that association of maternal thyroid function during early pregnancy was correlated with offspring IQ and brain morphology. Now, they used the data from the Generation R study, a massive study of uh, thousands of mother-pair child, mother-child pairs, sorry, um, and they looked at maternal thyroid hormone and TSH levels, and they also looked at antibodies. Then they looked at the children's IQ at six to eight, and they did MRI scans as well. And this is the result, and I really encourage you to look at the paper. It was published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology at the beginning of this year. They found that there was an optimum for maternal thyroxine concentration, and if the mother was hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, then there was an impact on the mean child IQ. Moreover, this same hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism impacted the risk of the child having an IQ less than 85. And they found similar results when they looked at their MRI scans for gray matter versus white matter. So we're looking 
uh, lineage decisions here in, in the developing brain and cortex volume. As I say, this sort of result, to my mind, becomes doubly disquieting, not only because of the importance of the maternal thyroid hormone levels in early pregnancy, but also for the fact that we now know that, like everybody else, pregnant women carry a, a chemical burden in their bodies. Tracy Woodruff looked at 33 compounds, she found, she looked at 52 compounds and she found that 33 were present in on average, in most pregnant women in the States, and she found 15 of these chemicals to be ubiquitous. These are the data from individual mothers, and these are the different chemical categories. We, in our team, we started to look at the levels, data, the different data sets, to see whether we could see what the concentrations of these 15 ubiquitous chemicals were in human amniotic fluid, and we came up with some surprises. Triclosan, 10 to the minus seven, a phthalate, Pestic legacy pesticides that have been taken off the market, perchlorate, PCBs, etc. And many of these compounds have been shown individually to act as thyroid hormone disruptors and to cause IQ loss. So I didn't give you any figure for the number of chemicals in the environment, but on the REACH, the regulation, evaluation, authorization of chemicals in Europe, we've got about 145,000 chemicals registered, and in the States, they're at 85,000 chemi 85, chemicals on the Toxic Substance Control Act list. So there's a lot of work out there. We've got a lot of chemicals out there and a lot of work to identify which ones impact on thyroid hormone signaling and brain development. And this is where... We had the idea um, 15 years ago that we would look at the different levels. This is a slide actually taken from Mary Gilbert from the EPA. There's so many levels at which endocrine disruptors can interfere with thyroid hormone production from obviously the hypothalamus and the pituitary, but distribution and, of course, in, in the target cells with the final output being brain development. So we took advantage of the fact that thyroid hormone signaling is conserved throughout the vertebrates, and we used a frog, as I said in my introduction, without the right amount at the right time, a frog, a tadpole fails to become a frog. We put in a, uh, a, a light-up gene, a GFP, put it under control of a, a very thyroid hormone-sensitive one, and we started to do screening. We developed the Xenopus embryonic thyroid assay, where we put in a T3 spike or a, an endocrine disrupting chemical, and we can measure out the amount of light produced by, by the beasts. This is the sort of findings that we're getting. We took the two most common perfluorinated compounds. They're used as surfactants. You, you spray them on your clothes. You, they're used in those Teflon uh, pans, etc. These are, the arrows indicate the concentrations in, in amniotic fluid, and this is the sort of dose response curve we're getting. Here's a fluorescence, the GFP fluorescence. Uh, here it's normalized against a T3 signal. And you can see we're getting very complex dose response curves, but we're getting increased thyroid hormone signaling. I just remind you that too much thyroid hormone is just as bad as too little. We've very much been focused on hyperthyroidism, but hyperthyroidism is also a problem. Two legacy pesticides that are found in amniotic fluid, HCB, and of course, uh, DDTE, which is the metabolite of DDT. And again, at concentrations found in amniotic fluid, we, we can see effects individually. One of the phthalates we tested does not have an effect, at the concentrations found in, in fluid, amniotic fluid, but one of them does. And we made a mixture of these 15 most common chemicals and we did a dose response curve. And as you can see, here's the, the T3 signal and here is a dose dependent increase in thyroid hormone signaling found in the, mainly in the brain because when we, we image the animals, we, we look at the, the brain. We also looked at whether these exposure to mixture modifies neuronal cell populations, and it does. We've, we've done clarity studies to look at inside the brain, so to speak. Here you can see just on a, a standard PCR that we've got a decrease in the expression of a neuronal marker and a decrease in the expression of an oligodendrocyte marker. And if we look at the ratios of these 
populations, we, we see significant differences. Here we've just focused on the hindbrain. And if we look at the, we count the number of neuronal cells, we can see a decrease. It's almost significant, P006. No significant change for the moment, though we've only done a few animals. We're increasing the number of oligodendrocytes. But we do see a decrease in neuronal volume and an increase in oligodendrocyte volume. These mixture effects also t um, affect behavior. Obviously, if we can't do an IQ test on the tadpole, but we can see how it reacts to light, and we see a significant decrease in the light responses and the total, amount, total distance covered in 10 minutes. So they're pretty lethargic. I've, had, I've been lucky enough to bring my group into uh, a big European study, EDC mixed risk. And one of the cohorts that's being studied within this consortium is a Swedish study, the Selma study, that covers 2,000 mother-child pairs. And what uh, Carl Gustav Bornhag and Chris Jennings from New, New York have done is that they've taken some pretty complex statistics and they've looked at the, 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 uh, fifth, the first 50 chemicals that we've been able to screen for, and they've done um, not quite... Uh, many, the, the, the test they've used is to, to try and find the bad actors that are associated with either a lower birth weight, a shorter anal genital distance, or language de delay, where this would be an effect on growth, this would be an effect on the reproductive system, and this would be an effect on the brain. Having established which act, bad actors came, were associated with each of these outcomes, they made, we made a, a mixture, and you can see that if we're looking at neurodevelopmental delay or language delay, we have a massive group, well, not a massive, it's four phthalates. We have our old favorite BPA, and we've also got the different fluorinated compounds that are the most associated with language de delay. Well, when we run this in our tadpole test, yet again, we find variations in thyroid hormone signaling. We find that there is an actual decrease in the thyroid hormone available if we run the test without thyroid hormone, and again, but at high concentrations when we run it with thyroid hormone. We get similar effects when we look at growth. The association of chemicals that come out positive when we look for a lower birth weight. Again, lots of phthalates, this time five, triclosan, and more perfluorinated compounds. And this time, again, we see a decrease both at the concentration found in human fluids, this is the concentrations, obviously in these mothers, we weren't looking at amniotic fluid, we were looking at blood levels and urine levels. So in terms of human exposure, this is the concentration. And even at 10 times, it's, it's a, we've got a, a dose response curve, but it's going the other way. But the most um, significant effect is found at one and 10 times human concentrations, exposures. And, he, and this time we find an increase when we put T3 on, on, the, on, on the tadpoles, and this obviously looks very much like what we were getting with the other mixture, which was based on American data. If I have the time, and I think I've got five minutes, I would li just like to address what are the consequences of these exposures. And I like to throw in this one, because it came out in the journal Intelligence in 2013, and it has this enigmatic title, Were the Victorians Cleverer Than Us? And they use reaction time and data of reaction time over 100 years, going back to Darwin's time, to see what has happened to the speed of reaction when somebody is shown a light and a pendulum goes past it or a sound. Obviously, if we're talking about reaction time, we're talking about myelination, and there are a few processes in brain development that are equally susceptible to thyroid hormone signaling as myelination. And they calculated, because you can do a calculation from reaction time to general intelligence, that over 100 years we've seen a decrease in general IQ of 14 points. 
This can be debated, and the causes can be debated, but it's interesting, disquieting again. And yet again, we can start to look at what the socio-economic costs are. And uh, I had the privilege of working with Leo Trasandi and Martin Belanger and, uh, and a lot of other people, looking at the costs of endocrine-disrupting chemicals. And we, we split ourselves into different groups, working on neurodevelopment or cancer, etc. And as you can see, it was the neurodevelopmental disorders that had the largest health cost, and this was largely due to pesticides. We reached a, a total of about 150 billion euros per annum for Europe. And you might say, pesticides, but surely everything's so well controlled for pesticides. They must be the best tested substances on the market. About the European Food Safety Authority published an opinion in 2013 as well, where they looked at different files of different pesticides that had been submitted for approval. They looked at specifically at thyroid hormone ac uh, actions and neurotoxicity, and they found that of the 287 pesticides that they looked closely at, they found 101 actually had data on thyroid hormone disruption, and yet they are on the market and they're in your food. So I think it is safe to say that chemical testing and regulatory decision making is simply not keeping play, pace with scientific knowledge. And today, I think Jean-Claude mentioned it, but obviously we've also got to take on board epigenetic effects and transgenerational effects. So with that, I would like to conclude. I've shown you that over 15 chemical classes are found ubiquitously in adults worldwide. I've also shown you data from other groups that chemicals pass the placenta and are found in amniotic fluid. We, in our hands, and not only in ours, it's been shown in many other studies that two-thirds of these chemicals, ubiquitous chemicals, can disrupt thyroid hormone signaling. This is unfortunate given that Numerous studies are now showing the importance of thyroid hormone signaling in early development and especially in early pregnancy. And maternal exposure to certain of these chemicals has been well documented as increasing the risk of neurodevelopmental disease and or IQ loss. I want to insist on the fact that of course all of these chemicals are evaluated individually and not as groups and we have very little data on the combined effects of these cocktails. I also would like to conclude by saying that legislation in Europe is currently blocked by very efficient lobbying from the chemical industry. And with that, I would conclude by thanking my co-workers, Jean-Baptiste Fini, who leads this work with me, um, Bilal Mugal, a PhD student, Michel and Petra, and Sebastian, our engineer. And I'm glad to say that we do get significant funding for this work. Thank you very much for your attention.